Hi, my name is Jan Jungman, and in this video we're going to use machine learning to build a gesture recognition system that runs on a microcontroller. So I have a device here, it's a board from ST Microelectronics, it's a Cortex-M4 running at 80 MHz and it has an accelerometer on it. And we're going to build a model that can distinguish between four different gestures. One is going up and down in a continuous motion, the other one is waving, the third one is going over my desk like a snake, and the last one is just idle. Now the idea with machine learning is that I don't explicitly program all of these things out. Rather, I collect lots of training data, I label those, this should be up down, this should be wave, then I train a machine learning model, and the machine learning model will figure that out. And then at the end of the tutorial, we'll actually deploy this back to the device, so the full machine learning model can run on device without needing my computer or needing mains power. So the device I've already connected is connected over Wi-Fi straight to Edge Impulse. That means that I can sample data from the device straight from the UI. Um, at this point, we don't have anything yet. So let's start with the first label, um, up, down. We'll tell it to uh, sample for 10 seconds um, at a frequency of 62.5 Hertz. Now for this model to work, we need about 10 minutes of data. Um, but it's very easy to collect it from here. So when I click Start Sampling, I start doing my move here. And what is very important here is that you capture lots of variations. So tilt the board a little bit while you're doing this. Uh, alternate between going fast and going slow. So my first sample is uploaded and I can uh, look at the raw data. This looks very jacked. Um, and that's because an accelerometer like picks up on every small little vibration that we have. But don't worry, we'll clean this up later. Um, so let's collect a second sample. Um, wave, and you'll see that there's a bit of difference already in the raw data, but it's very hard to actually distinguish that if you need to program this out yourself. Um, actually, if you want to build a good model, it's actually best to capture data from multiple people. Um, just me, uh, and it's intuitively, you always do the movements in a little bit the same manner. Um, so we see here up, down, um, and we see wave, and I'm gonna collect 10 more minutes of data, then I'll get back to you. All right, so we're done. We now have collected nine minutes of data, actually split between four labels. Um, so I have two and a half minutes of wave data, I have two and a half minutes of idle data, two minutes of snake data, and two minutes of up and down data. Um, but just drilling down the data, we're just clicking on it, you see a little bit of difference already. There's a snake, there's also a snake. Um, there's quite a bit of distinction between up down. The movements are a lot heavier. But it would be great if we don't have to program this out ourselves, let, them, let the machines figure it out. Together with my training data, I also collected some test data. And the test data is data that the machine learning algorithm will never see. Um, so it can't adjust itself to that. So this is nice to keep this separated so we can actually verify that what we're looking at, um, the, the conclusions that the model uh, makes actually make any sense, even on data that we've never seen before. So that's a really quick, quick way of building this. So we need to go from raw data to something processed, something we can throw into the neural network. Um, throwing the raw data in might work, um, but it's a lot easier and a lot faster if we can pre-process this data. Um, that works twofold. One, we clean the data up. Um, so we can, for example, remove the jackness here that we see. Um, and also it means if we can compress the feature space, so if we can turn this, then the multiple seconds of data into kind of what are the most important things we see in this data beforehand. That means that our machine learning model can be a lot smaller and that is really nice if we want to run it in the end back on the device again. Um, so to do that we create an impulse. So an impulse takes raw data and it uses a signal processing block, very standard digital signal processing, to extract features and then we have a learning block to actually classify new data. Um, the very first thing what we do is that we slice the data up in two second windows. Um, we're looking for continuous motion here, so it's not like thumbs up, it is I'm constantly waving. And we think that kind of the, the longest period that a wave or an up-down gesture will last is about two seconds. Um, so while we're slicing this up in windows, we use a sliding window approach, where for every window we increase the size with 80 milliseconds. So from this nine minutes of data, we can generate a lot of different windows um, and use that to make our training set a bit bigger. Um, so I wanna add a processing block and 
we have a spectral analysis block that is great for analyzing repetitive motion. Um, and that does an analysis on the frequency and power characteristics of the signal. And that works really well for um, our use case here. And then we need a learning block um, and we're gonna build a neural network. So this is my spectral features look. Um, there's three stages involved here. The first one is that we apply a filter. So we use this to kind of remove the jaggedness and also remove the, uh, the bias that we have here to 9.81 milliseconds uh, meters per second per second, the gravity that we also see if we, we look at accelerometer data because we're only interested in the movement. So this is after the initial low pass filter. Then we look at the frequency domain. So where are the peaks? So as you can see, um, the peak here is about at 1.5 hertz. Um, and then we look at the spectral power. How much power do we put into the signal? And we can play around with these parameters until we're satisfied. So for a use case here, a low pass filter is great, but we could also say, well, I want to do a high pass filter, maybe on some other data. Now the, what we want here is that if I'm looking at other data in the same category, that my graphs kind of look the same. Um, so a nice peak, a little bit over one hertz here on the green axis. That is something that I see on lots of these snake data. And if I look at up-down data, um, I see that there's movement on all of these three axes and there's more around one hertz. Now, why is that important? Um, if we choose our parameters wisely here, that means that we can already separate data quite nicely um, straight after, even before we throw it into the neural network. Um, so let's do that. We generate the features. So now we go over all the data that we have in our data set, the nine minutes of data, slice it up in Windows. Um, and then we run the feature extraction code, the one we just designed in the previous screen, um, to build our data set. And that's what we're going to throw into our neural network, where it's going to learn. So when the feature generation output is done, um, we have a view here, the Feature Explorer, which allows you to look at all the data in your data set in one go. So certain interesting features that we extracted, like the height of the first peak on the x-axis, we can plot against the spectral power between 0.5 and 1 hertz on the y-axis, um, and plot that again against the uh, spectral power on the z-axis between 0.5 and 1 hertz. And the cool thing is that you can start to separate your data already based on those features. If all your data is, uh, is not separable based on the parameters we chose here, maybe it means we need a different filter value um, or look at different, uh, different heights of our peaks. Um, but this actually works surprisingly well. Um, so we can now train a neural network. Um, let's train it, not at all. We make a very small neural network. Um, we have an input layer with only 33 features. This is quite cool because we took the two seconds of raw data, um, which is 180 points per second, 60 hertz. Um, so 360 uh, points of data, we threw that into 33 features already in the spectral features block. Then we have two layers in our neural network, hidden layers, and then an output layer. Let's train it for uh, one training cycle. Um, so we barely do anything. So a neural network works that it starts completely randomized. There's connections between the neurons. They start completely randomized. And then we, uh, we change those weights that are random at first a little bit during every training cycle. Um, but we barely did anything like that. So we see here in the confusion matrix that the network really idle, it can kind of see, which is quite normal. Idle, not much happens anyway. Um, but other than that, it thinks that everything is wave. So it performs very, very poorly. Um, so let's up that to 100 training cycles. Um, what's interesting here is that you can see the on-device performance already. So this is measured on a Cortex-M4, the same board that I have laying here. So we expect to need about six milliseconds of inferencing time on the device. Um, and we see a peak memory usage of about four and a half K. So after training for 100 training cycles, the model is doing much better. It might even say it's doing too well. At this point, we see 100% accuracy. This might be a case that is overfitting, um, so that the network learned from the data so well that it does very poorly uh, on new data. Um, but it might also be that our spectral features block was so good that we could separate it so easily. Um, so let's actually try that out. So in the live classification view, we can go um, and 
get new data from the device, but instead of putting it in our training set and use it to train the network, we're actually gonna ask the network to classify whatever it's seen. So it's gonna take the raw data, go through the spectral features block, um, and then classify and tell us what it was. So let's actually try that. And I'm gonna wave. And it's classifying. And actually the neural network told us that we saw wave 38 frames. So this is 100% correct. So this is really cool. I can actually drill down. So you see it's very confident. The confidence rating of one is the highest that there is that this was wave. And similarly, we can actually, if you see that something misclassifies, um, we can drill down in the spectral features explorer here. So we see the cluster of data to actually fall in and that is in the red cluster, which is wave data. So we can kind of reason about why the neural network is saying that something happens in the, in the way that it is. Um, that's great, we build a first model. Now there's one thing where neural networks perform very poorly and that is on data that has never seen before. Um, so let's uh, do a gesture that is never seen, a circle, um, and I'll see what the network thinks we're doing. So that's classifying. So it is not very sure. Um, out of the 38 windows that we created, it thought we were doing a snake three times. It thought we were doing up down 16 times and 19 times it was not sure. Um, so we can kind of drill down to where it wasn't sure. You can click here. Um, that was right here in this frame. Um, and then it is kind of hard, right? So how can we fix that? Now what we think is interesting is that if you look at the spectral features um, block, you can kind of see that the 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 purple data here, the purple cluster here, is quite far apart from any data that we've ever seen before. And that makes sense. This is a gesture that the model has never seen. Our spectral features block has mapped this to um, some data that doesn't look like anything we've seen. Um, and this is hard, right? The neural network doesn't have an unknown state. It will always try to classify in either of these clusters. Um, so how can we fix that? Well, there's more to the town than just neural networks. They're not the only game in town. There's also classic ML algorithms that we can use straight from Edge Impulse to use in conjunction with our neural network to actually filter these things out. So we're going to add a anomaly detection block. Um, and we use that anomaly detection block to find outliers in new data. And we do that without even labeling the data. We're just going to cluster all the data that we have. And then we look, and then if new data comes in, we'll look at the clusters. And if the data is outside of any known cluster, it's probably data we've never seen before and we want to be alerted of that. Um, so previously in the live classification view, when we were looking at the RMS values of the signal, we could already distinguish um, that this was completely different, quite good. So we're gonna train a unsupervised learning algorithm on 32 clusters here. We wanna have a high number of clusters because we want it to be very fine grained um, and on those three axes and let's see how that performs. Um, so it created um, these clusters. Um, you don't see everything because there's three axes and we can only show two here. Um, and let's actually look at the, uh, the verification thing that I did before. Um, I was waving here. So this fits very nicely in a cluster and we see that an anomaly score under zero, which means that it, it's, very, it's fitting very well inside a cluster. This is definitely data that we've seen before. But now if you're going to look at our circle movement, um, you already see that if we plot it on the X and the Y axis, is that it's far outside of the known data. It's still in the green, but in the blue. Um, so it's a bit hard to see, but we see here in our, we see that it's quite far outside of the stuff that we know. And if we look at our anomaly score, we see that the average distance to a known cluster is about 0.7. So much higher than zero. And right now on this data set, we feel that a minimum score before tagging this anomaly should be 0.3. So this is data outside of a known cluster um, for all of those. It means it's data we've never seen before. So now if we do it again and we load our uh, uh, existing test sample, uh, we'll see that now the 
model overrides everything we've seen before and it says well i don't trust the neural network on this because this data is not is unlike anything i've ever seen before we tag it all as an anomaly and this is really powerful because if we're dealing with real life sensor data um, the chance that you're mapping the complete input space the complete potential states that you encounter is very small and having a platform that can actually detect these kind of um, this kind of data and then alert you is really really valuable um, so last, let's actually uh, take a look at our, uh, how well our model performs against real data. So we said earlier, a neural network classifier scored 100%, might be a little bit too much. Um, so uh, we can use the test data as kind of a unit test for your code with data that the model has never seen before um, and try and classify that. So the first three, we don't have an expected label yet, but we see here, we expect up down here. Um, we misclassify a little bit here and up down, we misclassify a little bit here on wave. Um, and you can see that the main reason why we misclassify is because we think it's an anomaly. So this might very well be a variation, a way of doing up down um, that is different than any of the data in my data set. So if I feel that it's because of that, I can say move the training set, retrain, and the next time we'll classify properly. Um, so from this, we get an accuracy of 96%. What is important here is that it's not the neural network accuracy. It's the combination of things. So it's a combination of spectral features, neural network, and the anomaly detection block. Um, all going in one go. So with everything uh, up and ready, let's actually deploy this back to the device. So what we can do is take all the code that we just generated, all the configuration that we just generated, and then optimize highly, generate optimized binary code specifically for this board. Um, there's two ways of doing it. We can either output as a C library where you can just build it yourself and um, include it in your embedded project. Um, or in this case for the board that we have here, we can actually generate a binary straight from. So in this case, we build firmware, we put the uh, spectral features, the neural network classifier, any anomaly detection block straight in the firmware, and then we can run uh, without any network connection. So we're building this uh, binary right now. So we get a, a .bin file, I save it to disk. And then when I open my finder, I can go to the device here. It mounts as a mass storage device, like a USB key. Um, and I can drop my firmware just on here to flash. So with that all done, I can now open a serial terminal and connect directly to my board. Um, so I can run the impulse straight from here. So I'm talking directly to my board right now. Um, it doesn't need a connection to the internet. And when I do this, it will run the complete impulse as we just designed it on this board. It will sample data, run the spectral features block, run the neural network classifier and run the anomaly detection. So we're not doing anything, it's just sitting idly on my desk, but let's change that, let's do up down. And let's do wave. And now let's do some shaking, like data has never seen before. And stop. So very nicely, we first see up down with 100% confidence, we see wave with 100% confidence, and then finally we see my we see me shaking the board, gives an anomaly score of 8.6. This is definitely something we've not seen before. Now, the wonderful thing here is also is that it doesn't just run locally on the board. It's actually incredibly fast. So for the whole pipeline, including um, the spectral analysis, running the neural network classifier and running the anomaly detection method, uh, we do this in 20 milliseconds, 0 0.02 seconds right on this development board with 80 megahertz of code. I think that is absolutely fantastic. Um, so I hope you got a good idea of uh, what you can build with Edge Impulse, a bit of the potential of applying machine learning to typical sensor problems. Um, we'd love to see what you build with Edge Impulse. Thank you.